In 1925, Mr. Louis Debsloff, a German dairy farmer, offered the use of his one-room wood frame farmhouse to the residents of Independence Garden, the community currently known as Carverdale. Well, at that time, uh, this whole area was agricultural. Mr. Debsloff was a farmer, and he also had a dairy. Now, his property started where Kirk Elementary School is located, and it went uh, just across Britmo. And he was a very kind person, and he loaned, he uh, you let us use the farmhouse for our school. The Turner Road farmhouse served as both the church and the first school for students who lived in the Independence Garden community of Fairbanks, Texas, in Northwest Houston. The school, known then as Fairbanks Colored School, opened its doors to 19 students in grades 1 through 6. These students comprised the people that worked for the farmers. We used that school until we uh, transferred out of that building. Miss Lacey was the first teacher. Miss Lacey Houston rang the clanging school bell that sent out a welcome to the students who had just finished their one mile trek to school. It didn't seem like it was such a long way to us because it was a lot of children and mm -hmm. we played and we had fun. And sometimes we had a few fights, but all in all, uh, we had, uh, uh, it was like an adventure. We, we, when we'd get out, so we would be playing, and we had friends. As students filled the one-room schoolhouse, they were greeted by the warmth of a pot-bellied, coal-burning stove. It was one-room school, mm -hmm. and uh, we brought our lunches, and we had uh, the... Uh, Stripe it, the blue and white stripe it jelly bucket with the, the red, the apple butter, apple jelly came in the bucket. And when we used up all the jelly, we'd use it for lunch bucket. And um, we had um, bacon and biscuits and had a good old maple syrup. And we had a little place where we put all our lunches and our little caps and whatever on this bench. And uh, while we were sitting there, with, with, going on with our lesson, all those good smells were coming up in our <laughs> nose. But we still had to get our lesson. I think you told me at one time that the students would bring vegetables to the school and the teachers yeah. would bring the meat. Yeah. And then you all would cook the, and have soup. And have, and have a, a good, good sundali or stew, uh -huh. as you called it, for uh -huh. lunchtime. Uh -huh. What games did you all play at that oh, time in that school? Uh, ring around the roses, uh, a tisket, a tasket. The, we had jump rope. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we go, loop to loop. Uh, there were a number of games played during the recess. We had two recesses, really, for 10 o'clock. And then one, uh, about two. Primers were issued to the youngest children as students in grades three through six worked math problems on a single chalkboard. Everybody was in the same room, the children that started in the, in the primer, so we had the primer, and uh, through seventh grade. Well, those children that started, they would hear everything those other classes did. So when they got there, they already knew their lessons. The school was relocated to Macedonia Baptist Church on Dancy Lane in 1926. That meant that we had to move those church benches up and stack those up and put our desks down. And we did that on, like, Monday morning we went in. Everybody worked together to take our desks out of that little corner where we had stored them and uh, put them in the, the place where the benches for the church persons, we had to move those up on Friday evening. We'd stack theirs. We restacked them. We put down the church benches on Friday evening. And on a Monday morning, we move our church benches up and put our desks down. Miss Melissa DePoe taught from 1926 to 1928. Miss Clara Scott began teaching at the start of the 1928 term. I started school in 1929. I was six years old then. She brought me to school in a buggy. We was on a horse, and, I mean, we had a horse and buggy. And mama would bring me uh, to school 
and she had my little sister and my little brother with her to bring us to school, bring me to school. And she was bringing me to school over, over uh, to Macedonia. I wasn't, big, I wasn't old enough to go to school when Miss Lace and Miss Depot was here. So I went to, uh, went to school in, at the Macedonia Church. And uh, we was living about, about a half a mile off of Clay Road, beyond Clay Road. And that's when she would bring me to Macedonia it, with the horse and buggy. I met another uh, students were jealous of you getting to ride to school, and they were walking, weren't they? Yeah, they had to walk to school, but I had to ride. In 1937, the Wright Land Company donated property for a school on Clara Road, named in honor of Clara Scott. The Wright Land Company divided that in three portions, the Wright Land Farm and the Wright Land, I mean, the Independent Farm and the Independent Garden. Garden. And so therefore we had three sections there. And then when the dairymans, the dairy farmers moved out, they sold out and then they opened up that cow pasture section and named it Carverdale. And so therefore we got Carverdale Independent of garden and independent farm. And they, they, they moved the Old Main Elementary School over. It was a, a wooden school that they moved over to that location for us. Which became the first permanent school building for what would eventually be known as Carverdale School. That same year, Fairbanks Colored School had its first graduating class of four students. Savannah Jones, Hazel Scott, Bertha May Strait, and R.A. Strait. The Rose Hill School of Cypress consolidated with Fairbanks Colored School in 1951, and the school was renamed Carverdale School in the honor of the surrounding community. Mr. W.S. Waddy was principal at the time, and the faculty grew to three teachers, Ms. Clara Scott, Ms. Magdalene Snell, and Ms. Arlene Archer. And this, this school went from grades one through? Through seven. Through seventh. And when we uh, finished, Fairbanks Colored Elementary School, see, we went to Harper School mm -hmm. in Sixth Ward, and that mm -hmm. was a middle school. And when we finished Harper, we went to Booker T. Washington on um, West Dallas. I went to my relatives and, and Bertie and R.A. went to theirs, and we went from there for a whole week we, to live with the relatives and then come home on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Well, we did that up until Dad got transportation for us. Now, My dad was the one who, whose bus, it was really a pound truck that he converted and put benches, wooden benches in it so that we, we the kids, would have places to sit to, uh, to ride from out here into Booker T. Washington High School. And how was that truck? That truck? There was a green truck, a uh -huh. green pound truck, that Mama rode school bus on with whitewash. Every time it rained, you had to go over and wash it. <coughs> go over that uh, school bus, you had to go over and, and ride it again on the, on the side of the, the bus. Of course, the kids teased us about it because <laughs> they had yellow school buses coming in from Acres Home and other areas, outlining mm -hmm. areas. So, but we didn't mind, we were going to school. More classrooms in a junior and senior high school were added over the next few years, and Carverdale was officially dedicated. Mr. J.D. Richards became principal of Carverdale, which now served high school students, and he had a staff of 11 teachers. The campus now featured a library, a band hall, and a choir room, as well as multiple classrooms for all grade levels. Mr. W.M. Batts became Carverdale's principal in 1959, Renovations in 1967 included carpeting for all classrooms, air conditioning for the entire school, and adding a gymnasium and additional classrooms. African American students from all over the Houston area were bused into Carverdale. Yeah, some of them were um, Lily White, Katie, Avery. Um, students were bused in through our school from uh, these outlining areas. 
that meant that that made Carbondale a large school, didn't right. it? Right. I understand at one time that there were over a thousand students enrolled mm -hmm. at, at Carbondale. To partition classrooms allowed for utilization of an innovative educational model, open concept, and team teaching. The man that instituted this that came down to Carbondale was Dr. E.A. Eaton, and he came from University of Texas. Some of the elementary teachers from the first through the fifth grade went up there, and then he came down and taught them. This open concept, they were taught in suites. The classrooms were divided in suites, and there was usually three or four teachers in one suite for one grade, and the teachers took turns speaking to the students. They had what they called large groups and small groups. And uh, the Cypress Fair Dane School District at the time was recognized all over the United States for having this open concept. We had visitors that would come in from all over, and even had some to come from overseas. Almost 90% of Carverdale teachers held master's degrees or higher, and many staff members received local and statewide honors. Three of Carverdale's first four graduates, Bertha Strait Lee, Savannah Jones Coyer, and R.A. Strait, would turn to work at their former school. When Mr. Richards came, it was, well, that's when I was hired, when I had finished Prairie View and, and came out here to work. So, I, I was hired by Mr. Richards. I taught uh, the business courses, uh -huh. all of them, typing, shorthand, bookkeeping. I came to work at Coverdale in 62. I was in, I worked in the kitchen mm -hmm. at that time. You lived in the Coverdale community? Yes, I lived in Coverdale. Uh -huh. Okay. And I worked for the school district 19 years. I got a job as principal secretary at the Coverdale. Secretary to you came the same year that Mr. Betts Mr. came. Betts, he was, and and I, that, what Mr. Year was that now? Me. September of 1964. I came as an English and history teacher, and later on, I became a librarian. Both school administrators and parents worked closely together. Well, Most of the Carverdale uh, teachers lived in the community, mm -hmm. and um, we had very good attendance to the, you know, the, the PTA. I think it's, it's PTO now. PTA then. Well, it was PTA then, mm -hmm. and uh, they would chaperone you help when we'd go out of town for games, basketball and football. See, some of the parents would go and help chaperone the students, and uh, they were very involved with the activities of the school, and uh, um, they would uh, come to the you know to the campus and would participate, and uh, they. Uh, was always involved in some type of activity that we had going on. The parents cooperated, and if you got into trouble at school, you just go home and you were still in trouble. So it was just like a little small town. During this time, it was common for students to receive academic honors in state competitions and athletic events. Students were also actively involved in student council, yearbook, Spanish club, mademoiselles, science club, band club, choir, cheerleaders, drill team and twirlers, future teachers of America, industrial arts, future homemakers of America, drama club, library club, and explorer scouts. Carverdale's football, volleyball, and track teams did well in their regional competitions, and the basketball team won two state AA championships. Two particular days that were celebrated during the school year, and that was boys' days and girls' days. Mm -hmm. You remember those? Yes. And what happened on those days? Well, we brought uh, our standing speakers in. In fact, George Bush, who was at that, uh, at that time uh, congressman, was one of our speakers. Barbara Jordan came to speak to us on occasion. Mrs. Feast and Mrs. Collier had buildings named in their honor. The school was built and dedicated in 1989. The Bernice R. Feast Elementary School, and it's located off of Highway 6 at 8425 Falls Street. And at first, when the school was first opened, we had a thousand students. And that was the greatest thing that ever happened to me <laughs> when we had that dedication. The people were there, they came and came and came. They, usually they only do dedicated schools on Monday nights, but I had asked them to dedicate mine on Sunday because I knew that we would get more participation. And one of the churches, the, in Carverdale. Didn't even leave from 11 a.m. worship service. They just stayed and got buses and came out there to my school. And that was Greater Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church. 
a later library was named and dedicated to you, uh, Mrs. That, Collier. That yeah. was, yeah, that was furnished by uh, Harris County Community Action Association, which was working in the community. Uh -huh. And I was uh, the community representative in, uh, as a result of their interest and in our, in our children and all, and since we didn't have a library, they donated a portion of our uh, side fair property for this building. Mm -hmm. In October of 1968, the Department of Health and Education and Welfare ruled that Cypress Fairbanks ISD's use of the Freedom of Choice Plan, instituted in 1964, did not integrate as fully as anticipated. Carverdale School was closed by order of the United States Justice Department in the fall of 1970. Mr. Bob Davis was the last principal of Carverdale School. And the students were sent to different schools until they built Kirk Elementary School. But the teachers went to various schools. But one thing about this that I like and that really does make me think is that where Kirk Elementary School is, is sitting so close to the first site of the school. So I think that we have come around full circle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the good part about it.